thank you for attending. Uh, let me uh, also uh, welcome those who are watching live via webcast. Uh, this, today's event is being recorded and will be available on, at CSIS.org uh, after the presentation for uh, as long as anybody pays attention to it. My name is Scott Miller. I'm the uh, Scholl Chair in International Business. I run the International Business Program here at CSIS. Today's event is part of a series of programs on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The series has been uh, uh, developed by the Scholl Chair in International Business and the Sumitro Chair in Southeast Asia Studies as a joint project. We're in our second year of, uh, of programs. Year one focused primarily on the broad uh, economic and geostrategic matters associated with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Year two is focusing on specific elements uh, that are particularly uh, interesting and dynamic uh, in the commercial environment as it's developing. Today's subject is the digital economy and TPP. Commercial use of the internet, that is the digital economy, has experienced rapid growth since the mid-1990s. It's been, uh, rad it's radically altered the array of business to business and business to consumer transactions being done. It changes daily. It is one of the most disruptive technologies that any of us have ever experienced in our lives. That disruption, uh, which we all benefit from and enjoy uh, every day, whether it's from our mobile phone technology or the ability to access goods and services via the internet, or from a business standpoint, the, the, the operation of the industrial internet and the uh, massive efficiencies generated through supply chain improvements, uh, which are IT enabled. Uh, this rapid disruptive development has created a gap between the commercial reality of the digital economy and the, and the international policy governing the digital economy. That's why today's program will uh, examine that policy environment in the context of TPP. We'll help, we hope to illustrate the gaps and have an have a open discussion on what can be done to address those gaps and, and uh, fill them over the course of this negotiation and into the future. Why TPP? Well, it's an important subject in the digital economy because, partly because it's next. If you look at the history of trade negotiation, as trade, as trade agreements have proceeded at a pace that the digital economy has proceeded, each successive agreement includes more disciplines and more uh, obligations. Uh, and so this is just next in line. And, and at, at this point in time, uh, the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement was probably the best we've done. That was a 2006 negotiation. It, now, now uh, six years later, seven years later, it's time to improve it, and the underlying environment has changed dramatically. Second, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership has a high level of ambition and is one of the four in which U.S. firms are most interested in uh, engaging with other like-minded economies in creating a template. And that template is important in TPP in part because of the diversity of the economies. My own view is that if you can get an agreement on the key principles of the digital economy and the way it ought to be governed in international trade uh, among parties as different as Brunei, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, and the United States and Japan and Australia, uh, you probably have a robust enough uh, agreement to be able to socialize it further and get broader adoption in other multilateral and plurilateral fora. So it's, it's, a, it's a timely, it's, uh, it's a high standard agreement, so it's an opportunity to reach and, and deal, deal with this gap in a very productive way, and it's an opportunity to set a standard that can be adopted by other parties in other fora. We'll start today with, uh, with a keynote speaker and then move on to a panel discussion. I'm delighted to welcome Congressman Jared Polis to CSIS uh, as our keynote speaker. Mr. Polis represents the second district of Colorado, that's north central Colorado, basically the cities of Boulder and Fort Collins. Um, he was first elected in 2008 and is a member of the Committee on Rules and the Committee on Workforce and Education. Now the Congressman has, in my view, having, having been a, uh, a lobbyist here for a long time in the city has, and dealing with a lot of members of Congress from a lot of backgrounds, Congressman Polis is quite distinctive. First, he's not a lawyer, which makes him different from the majority of his cohort. Not that there's anything wrong with being a lawyer. <laughs> it's just the most common background, okay? More, more importantly, Congressman Polis is an entrepreneur. He's a digital entrepreneur. 
He founded American Information Systems while he was still an undergraduate and has successfully launched BlueMountain.com and ProFlowers.com, which many of you may have used last uh, Mother's Day. Uh, in any case, uh, he has a unique perspective and brings, brings a, uh, an orientation to the, the space of the digital economy that is quite rare among his colleagues, and we very much look forward to hearing from him. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Jared Polis. Thank you. Um, and as, as you can tell by the way I, I, I dress here, I'm a digital economy guy. Um, and uh, I don't get to speak to the foreign policy establishment very often, so hopefully it won't need much translation, but you're welcome to ask any questions about what I say. But my perspective uh, comes from somebody who's been an entrepreneur uh, in, uh, in the internet economy. I have, in the private sector before serving, you know, been involved with some light version of trade issues in my flower company. We certainly imported flowers from Colombia and South America. Uh, so, and, and, and we also had a Canadian operation on the retail side. So, uh, I, I'm not a complete stranger to uh, the, being a practitioner on those trade issues. And it was a trade-dependent business in that perspective, but it was a, it was a very expedited area. We didn't have to... Uh, do any groundbreaking uh, uh, trade work, obviously um, flowers entering through Miami and, and uh, uh, meet most of the, the need for flowers in our country. So it was a um, relatively simple thing. On the digital side though, uh, I've been deeply involved with a number of different uh, internet and e-commerce companies since the early days of the internet. My, I co-founded an internet access provider in 1994. Uh, so we've seen a lot of this uh, grow up around in me, and as such, I've had the opportunity to be on uh, nearly every side of every type of issue that uh, early stage and high tech companies face. So, you know, for instance, with regard to capital formation, we've uh, raised capital from conventional VC, uh, been an investor in venture capital, taking a company public, raised formal private rounds, sold companies bought companies. Um, so on the capital formation side, I got to see uh, a little all of that. And of course, more applicably here on the intellectual property side, also uh, got to uh, be on most sides of uh, intellectual property and patent issues. For instance, uh, uh, named inventor on several patents, you know, gotten uh, frivolous notices of infringement, had to fight, etc. So been on all sides. Um, uh, uh, of, of all those battles over the years. So I take those experiences to um, my approach on TPP and trade. Um, part of uh, my frustration with the TPP process that some of you might share has been the lack of transparency. So um, Daryl Issa, who I work with on a number of tech-related issues, and I did a letter asking for more transparency. The truth of the matter is, if you wonder what type of congressional oversight uh, we're able to have, uh, I can meet with the negotiators and review all of our negotiating documents in a private room without my staff even being present. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even allowed to bring my staff or take anything out of the room that I review uh, current and prior drafts of TPP uh, and discussions of our negotiating position. Now, um, I've done my best to make the most of that, of that ability. I've had them in several times and uh, we, we meet and, and uh, but it's, it's challenging without uh, being able to uh, have the normal staff resources or uh, being able to um, have the same kind of follow up that we would with kind of a normal more normal oversight process. And, and of course, no one would argue that this should all be uh, aired publicly, but it would be nice to have a way for A, Congress to do its oversight work more effectively, but B, the American public uh, to be able to and to engage stakeholders in a more meaningful uh, discussion of uh, intellectual property in the digital economy and of course other issues that surround TPP. Uh, as a former uh, internet entrepreneur, one of my objectives since I was elected was to bring the perspective of entrepreneurship and startups to Congress on tech issues and other issues related to the digital economy. 
uh, our extensive digital outreach include you know a number of successful AMAs on Reddit. I'm chair of the bipartisan House Caucus on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and uh, I've worked on a number of issues that are important to the technology community. Uh, we are we also are seek, have we launched recently a Startup Day Across America initiative on August 29th, where we're trying to get members of Congress from as many districts as possible to visit startups uh, in their district. And one of the interesting things about startups in their districts in this day and age is many of them are trade dependent and international. Um, I mean, it could be a one person shop, a three person shop, uh, but if you're providing a fundamentally digital product or service, you're just as likely to have your early customers in England or India uh, as you are a block away. Um, now, that depends on the particular nature of any business, but what you have is essentially the ability to launch into a global marketplace from your garage. Uh, and that was uh, not the case uh, in prior uh, pre-digital era trade negotiations, and we need to uh, contemplate the great benefits that this brings to small businesses and entrepreneurs, not just here, but also uh, a person you know, operating out of their garage in, in other countries as well. Uh, has unprecedented access today to the American marketplace, uh, and even more so, and in a better um, uh, design fashion, uh, through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. <clears throat> um, I have been focused on a number of uh, free and open Internet access issues. Uh, they ranging from uh, issues like net neutrality to uh, trying to prevent uh, uh, Measures like SOPA and PIPA for moving forward, which would have been damaging to the Internet ecosystem. Uh, there's also been uh, a, a lot of changes since the passage of the Digital Millennial Copyrights Act. And um, we've been very interested in engaging in copyright reform in the 113th Congress, um, looking at duration and strength and, and the process for seizing domain names uh, through Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and patent reform uh, as well. And, and patent reform, of course, within the context domestically of uh, reducing what we call patent trolls, but also kind of looking at in the long run as we sort of reinvent our intellectual property protection system for the digital economy, uh, finding the right way to protect people's works and at the same time uh, disseminate the benefits of, of innovation. Um, what worked for and does work still for mechanical innovation uh, is fundamentally different than the policy framework that one should want to have for digital innovation. The two are, are different things, and I would argue for biological innovation as well. The and uh, by the way, we've been I was we were in session until midnight last night, and I'm just so, <laughs> so I'm a little hoarse, and we're you know if I, you know it says unrelated topics the Department of Defense uh, uh, appropriations, although we do have a um, Prism uh, amendment at NSA uh, um, amendment that would pr take away the authority of our government to uh, to do what they did through Prism coming up here in a few few hours. It's been one of the the, m the more hotly debated ones. But I think um, one of the, the things we need to do within our trade agreements, and it's a fine line, is we need to, of course, define the uh, baseline parameters for intellectual property protection. At the same time, we need to give our own government, our own Congress, the ability to adapt and reform our own intellectual property laws for a digital economy, um, which... Uh, is a process that has started and is underway, and certainly Digital Millennial Copyrights Act was a step forward, but is one that is certainly not uh, work complete. Uh, and I would argue that uh, we have a, a long way to go uh, with regard to creating a framework for intellectual property law for the 21st century, uh, and I want and making sure that we don't tie ourselves into the parts of uh, intellectual property law that don't currently work. Uh, through trade agreements, which would give ineffective policies a longer tail uh, by making it more difficult to have a reasonable discussion about what they should look like. Now, there's a number of trade issues before the 113th Congress, and uh, uh, I'm a strong believer in, in trade as a driver for growth uh, in our country. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, I was able to be part of the United States Congress when we passed the uh, three 
uh, trade agreements that I, of course, voted for uh, South South Korea, Panama, and Colombia. Uh, I think those those will be important job creation mechanisms in our country and in our allied countries as well. Um, but again, the internet and digital economies are a unique opportunity, um, a unique opportunity not only for entrepreneur, garage entrepreneurs we talked about, but also for U.S. multinationals and other countries as well. Um, by ensuring that we have a good set of rules to operate under and a good framework um, that includes things like cross-border da data flows, uh, not holding intermediaries liable, uh, no localization barriers. Uh, we can foster economic trade and, and growth on the digital side uh, among all the signatories to the TPP. Uh, just as in the physical world, there has always been a short-sighted uh, uh, tendency of, of uh, countries to engage in protectionist activities, so too is there in the digital world. Now they look different. They don't take the same form. Uh, and frankly, uh, efforts in the digital world are less effective when nation states, states try to engage in protectionism. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, to have a formal policy framework uh, that can prevent that where possible will be an enormous sense for a step forward and provide surety uh, to, uh, to uh, technological providers on, on both sides. So this is an exciting opportunity through Trans-Pacific Partnership. I also uh, wrote, wrote a letter encouraging the addition of Japan uh, to TPP. The administration is aggressively negotiating uh, TPP, uh, which is a very important agreement that promises to be a uh, set a new benchmark for uh, trade agreements in the digital era. Uh, that frankly we can use to uh, uh, to include in, in other agreements as well. Um, you know, as an example, we were just talking in a small group before this, and I've of course been a strong supporter of NAFTA over the years as well. When NAFTA was written, uh, the digital economy was in a very early stage, and it wasn't really written uh, uh, in contemplation of what is becoming one of our biggest economic drivers. Through TPP process, we have the opportunity to take NAFTA as well to the next level uh, with Mexico as a signatory, really looking at what, and I've been part of the U.S.-Mexico parliamentary exchange since I joined Congress every year. We meet with members of the uh, Diputados um, of the Mexican uh, government and we alternate between U.S. and Mexico and we have pretty much the same discussion every year uh, where we say what is the next evolution of NAFTA that's the economic part then we have the security part where we talk about drugs and cartels and, uh, and, and so I mean we have but anyway ever since I've been part of that we have a section on, on taking and it's the same thing you have the majority on both sides that are interested in doing this, and then you have a few people on both sides that want to roll back what we've already done. But um, but the point is, we haven't made any substantial progress on this, and TPP is the first opportunity uh, to further develop the relationship with uh, our allies and our, our trading bloc, the North American trading bloc, so as better to compete with other trading blocs in the global economy. And we're seeing, we've seen since NAFTA, an increased interdependence between the Mexican, United States, and Canadian economy. And that's a good thing uh, when you look at the closer security arrangement uh, that America has with our allied nations in North America uh, as compared with alternative trading partners that are geopolitically more challenging uh, in terms of the, the mutual reliance. So uh, it's a very good thing uh, that through TPP we can further develop the North American trading bloc and NAFTA concept uh, so that it encapsulates the digital economy, which we all expect to be one of the major uh, growth uh, areas in the coming decades. Uh, not that by in any way, shape, or form the physical economy and the product-based economy is obsolete. It's not. In fact, the two are intertwined. Uh, when you're talking about, for instance, manufacturing, you're also talking about a flow of digital information regarding specifications that might originate in real time with real time feedback digitally over something that also has a physical manifestation. So the two are linked uh, in, in many ways. Uh, I don't want to 
in any way uh, insinuate that uh, they're mutually exclusive. Our international treaties in general have not kept pace with uh, the growth of the digital economy. Uh, WTO rules were uh, largely set between 93 and 97, uh, well before the digital economy came to the prominence it has today. Uh, and before, frankly, we even had domestic policy frameworks, uh, which while still lacking are further along uh, than they were in the 90s. Uh, neither the WTO nor even our most recent free trade agreements offer the right framework for the free flow of digital goods, services, and data. Uh, and uh, in many ways, in an area where we should be the strongest with regard to uh, trade promotion and free trade considerations. We have weaker rules than we have for any other uh, sector. Uh, and, and, you know, this is not merely a hypothetical discussion. Foreign governments are considering and have and are looking to enact policies that block cross-border data flow or favor their domestic interests uh, over American interests. Uh, we've seen repressive governments like China that are manipulating or blocking flows of data for political reasons or for unknown reasons. Um, and uh, this is something that we continue to face uh, in the digital economy. As a 2010 white paper from Google talked about, uh, in a pure, what looked like to be a pure tit for tat, to retaliate for a congressional honor for the Dalai Lama, Chinese officials manipulated. Uh, their so-called Great Firewall, so that users who typed in a web, ad web, ad web address for the three major U.S.-based Internet search engines, Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo, were not taken to their site of choice, but rather they were taken to the Chinese-owned search engine uh, instead. Uh, so again, uh, what might have been used as a political tit-for-tat had real trade ramifications. Effectively, they were diverting traffic to a uh, domestically owned search engine uh, at the expense of traffic where the customers were desiring to use uh, American uh, um, U.S.-based search engines. And this restriction that foreign governments have placed on, on connectivity and access and data flow has significant implications to our economy and to their economies. Uh, everything from tomorrow's innovators to today's online retailers to search engines to cloud providers. Uh, and it should be uh, front and center uh, with regard to our TPP uh, negotiations as well. I think the administration recognizes the expanding uh, role of digital trade as a driver of economic growth. Uh, however, we need to do a better job with regard to both transparency as well as with the advisory groups that surround the TPP process. Um, I, as one member of Congress, are doing what I can. We're encouraging my colleagues to do the same. But with everything going on, and frankly, with the difficulties that we have, namely being in a room by ourselves temp, you know, and having to set it up ahead of time to even review this, it is difficult to get the kind of meaningful input from my colleagues um, uh, that I think the process would benefit from. And ultimately, if the process wants to and it needs to, have the buy-in of policymakers who will ratify and support the treaty, uh, they should do a better job in a more open manner uh, engaging the uh, elected officials as stakeholders today. And frankly, the individuals that are here in this room have a critical role to play uh, in educating uh, your own respective governments, if you represent governments other than our own, our government and businesses, as well as the administration and members of Congress. Uh, on many of the issues uh, surrounding trade in the digital era uh, that you are familiar with as well. So there are great opportunities. Uh, there are also great challenges um, with regard to trade policy in the digital era. Um, I'm continuing to work to increase transparency, expand the representation on ITAC 15, ITAC 8 to a large group of economic interests. I uh, want to make it sure that the treaty doesn't tie Congress's hands and make it difficult for us to update our own intellectual property laws for the digital era, but at the same time provides a baseline to ensure that disparate treatment is not given uh, to data that originates in different countries among the signatories to DPP. Uh, in addition to um, 
this agenda I've touched upon, I wanted to mention how the 113th Congress and also the TPP negotiations have been impacted by recent revelations uh, like the PRISM regulation and, uh, and the NSA uh, regulations, which we'll be addressing here on the floor of the House. This has caused um, psychological but very real reactions among m many members of the electorate and politicians, of course, following that lead in, in Europe and in Brazil and other countries. And frankly, uh, as somebody myself, speaking as myself, who I'm critical of uh, what I consider to be an overreach, uh, a violation of privacy, this is an externality that should be accounted for. Of course you're going to offend your friends. And, uh, and there are those who would use uh, that popular opinion and would demagogue that popular opinion who might have had anti-trade agendas all along in other countries but will use that to uh, implement protectionist measures uh, because of the tide of groundswell of public opinion against the what they perceive to be an American security apparatus overreach into the privacy of their nationals. So that should be part of the equation when we're thinking about how we balance security and privacy, we should think about public perception in allied countries, and we should think about how public perception impacts trade. Uh, and this is not hypothetical, this is playing out now uh, in a number of countries and quite possibly will impact the uh, TPP negotiations as well. So those are some of my initial thoughts. I, I look forward to uh, addressing your questions and, uh, and uh, discussing how we can better leverage our trade agreements and TPP in particular uh, for the digital economy. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, he, the Congressman is, has a few minutes to take some questions. Uh, I'd like to ask to uh, follow three simple rules for the questions. First, if you have a question, once the Congressman recognizes you, please wait for the microphone as a courtesy to our digital audience. Uh, second, when you start, please introduce yourself and uh, identify your organization. And third, what I call the Alex Trebek rule, please make sure your question is actually in the form of a question. Leave your statements for another forum. So My, my constituents need to hear your rules, too, because they, <laughs> they never follow that third one. <laughs> Okay, uh, yes, Who's, who has the mic there? Microphone will be right over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for your... Uh, if you could introduce yourself real uh, yes. quickly before the question. Uh, my name is Jeff Oken Kozlowicki. I'm a visiting fellow with Third Way. And I have a brief question for you regarding your remarks about uh, transparency in the negotiating process. The, the U.S. Trade Representative has um, created unprecedented levels of engagement with stakeholders um, compared to previous free trade agreements um, in the TPP process. And I was wondering um, how you would say that the administration can increase public engagement and oversight um, over the TPP negotiations without publishing draft text or otherwise sure. comprom compromising the U.S. negotiating position. Excellent question. And so, uh, first of all, I, I am... I'm no historical authority on past negotiations, obviously. I mean, uh, I, I you know, was, I think, in college when NAFTA was being negotiated and read about in the paper. But I did, we did have a small group that convened earlier, and, and there, were, there seemed to be a couple ideas and a couple things that I, I don't know if this premise of somehow this, this being the most transparent is, it conforms to reality here. In prior trade negotiations, it's my understanding that uh, there have been uh, daily briefings for uh, ITAC members. Uh, there are no longer daily detailed briefings on negotiations. In addition, when we talk about the public side, the general public side of the engagement process, uh, it should be a lot, much more of a discussion um, you know, rather than just a listening session. So again, um, obviously without uh, compromising our negotiating positions, uh, there should be more of an effort even both within ITAC, of course, in terms of the uh, more frequent updates and, by the way, broader diversity of representation on those ITAC councils, which the administration has expressed willingness to do, but we haven't yet seen. Uh, and we continue to work with them on uh, recommending candidates that would provide a better representation of the digital economy specifically, but frankly, uh, American job creation and growth engines should be better represented on ITEC. So better representation on ITEC, 
more and better use of iTech, and then more engagement with the general public in terms of a give and take. Um, so those would be the three. Again, as a non-expert, uh, those would be three that I think are, are inadequate. And then the fourth I would add is a better th way to do congressional oversight, because this is not very effective for me to have to go to some room and you know schedule it and not be able to take. I mean, I think there's got to be some way that uh, we can have more meaningful congressional involvement uh, with that process too. So those would be my suggestions. I think we saw one over there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Bernie Lee. I'm an intern with the Department of Commerce. Uh, my question about TPP with the digital um, regulations or negotiations they have, a number of negotiations have stalled because of the problems with uh, agriculture like uh, New Zealand dairy or um, uh, and also with uh, textiles and fabrics for Vietnam. So um, in the negotiations, is do you, do you think that the U.S. Congress would be willing to ratify a, a trade agreement that would make compromises on agricultural textiles in the industries for these digital services and protections in IPR? Um, because you also have a competing agreement with the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that's been started by the ASEAN group with the other, other Asian nations that's lower standards, which doesn't benefit the United States but could be much more appealing to some of the weaker economies in that region that might want to ratify that to get uh, some more uh, oomph in their uh, lower level industries. Well, I mean, you know, I have not, nor has anybody for, really formally taken the temperature of Congress or done vote counts on who supports what. Obviously, ag interests are uh, influential. Um, however, we saw that an ag, a major ag bill nevertheless failed, right? So uh, perhaps they're not as influential as they were. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, there's always a sort of give and take in these trade agreements and, um uh, I think that, and I hope that, our focus is on the great opportunities for the digital economy that can emerge from TPP, uh, and that um, you know we can also move forward on agricultural and manufactured goods and everything else in terms of tearing down trade barriers and removing protectionism. So, um, again, I think in general, the majority of Congress is certainly pro-trade. Um, we saw strong votes uh, on ratification of the last three trade agreements. Uh, so I would anticipate uh, the same type of reception uh, for tearing down barriers and textiles and ag uh, and, uh, and, and with the right framework for the digital economy. I would also add that this is not top of mind for most members of Congress. I mean, it's not to the point where I could even go or anybody could say, what do you think? It I mean, it's not on their rate. People have other things they're focused on, their committees are worked on. I mean, I think that uh, most members of Congress are at best only slightly aware that these negotiations are taking place, um, other than perhaps some people on Ways and Means and, and the Committee of Jurisdiction that are, that are aware of it or working on it. Yes. We got the microphone coming. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm uh, Bruce Van Voorst, former financial and economic correspondent for Time Magazine. Uh, nobody would disagree that digital age is going to be a major factor in economic growth in the future. However, you did point out that there will be challenges. How will digital development impact uh, employment? There's a big difference of opinion of uh, it will undercut employment or it will enhance employment. Enhance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, this it's 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 a it's a you know longer discussion. I mean, you need to have that's kind of a you know economists and futures. I mean, it's the old discussion of you know it, does doing something in a new and more efficient way uh, benefit the economy and create jobs or not? And uh, I think that uh, artificial efforts to preserve less efficient legacy methods is always damaging to the economy and facilitating transitions to new and efficient ways to produce products uh, is good for the economy. Uh, economists would generally agree with me. Um, 
that doesn't mean, of course, that there's not a human impact that while in the aggregate is positive and helps more people than it hurts, it doesn't mean that people aren't hurt. Of course, we know that. Um, globalization uh, has winners and losers. Uh, it's great for uh, people in general. More people benefit than lose their jobs. But it's not great if, uh, you know, it's hard place to find the right example. But I mean, let's say it's... Uh, uh, I, 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 who, where's our friend from? What, what, what has been displaced in Mexico by America? Has, has, has corn been, maybe American corn producers are exporting to Mexico now and it displaced some local farmers? I don't know. That's a, if that happened, it was bad if you were a corn farmer in Mexico. But uh, again, there's winners and losers. It's great if you were one of the many Mexican growth companies that is exporting more and doing more business with America. So um, policymakers, of course, are concerned with those who uh, are on the short end of that. Um, part of the issue with the digital economy, of course, will be access, um, uh, particularly making sure that every uh, people have access to the many benefits of the new economy. But yes, job creation, economic growth, uh, new and efficient ways of doing things, um, that's what the digital co economy has provided and will provide. So, so one more question. Hi, my name is Ashley Hess. I'm an intern at the British Embassy, and I was just wondering if you had any opinion on um, to what extent uh, negotiations in the TPP on the digital economy could affect negotiations on TTIP for digital economy issues. You know, I think that... There we go. Oh, it's okay. I got cut off. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think we have not yet had... Um, a, uh, a trade agreement that encapsulates the pressing issues facing the digital economy. So I think what we have, we're not there by any means, but what we have uh, through TPP is the opportunity to develop a template that uh, would be employable for uh, as a basis for other negotiations. Um, and it's, a, it's an opportunity we don't want to pass up. Um, so I'm hoping, again, that uh, focusing on things like uh, cross-border data flows and uh, intermediate liability and uh, preventing localization uh, barriers, um, these kinds of things dealing with the whole realm of fair use uh, and, and, and DMCA. Uh, if we can get the template right now, there's a lot of danger in getting the template wrong because you, if you lock in a template that is wrong uh, from a policy perspective, there's a longer tail on it. But if we, can, and it's not right now yet, but if we can get it right, uh, this can serve as a model for uh, other trade agreements as well, and, and I think that's even more of a reason to put the effort into it in the context of TPP. Well, thank you, the Congressman. And uh, let me invite the uh, panelists up. We'll continue on uh, dead ahead. <laughs>